This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today, we look at the scope, the scale, sustainability of the protests in Iran, which have entered their second month, after being sparked in September by the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini, while in custody of Iran's so-called morality police. More than a thousand protesters have been arrested. Some children have been sent to so-called re-education camps. The United Nations said Tuesday at least 23 children have been killed in the protests, one aged 11 years old. The Guardian reports another schoolgirl was killed by Iranian police after she was beaten when she refused to sing a pro-regime song during a raid on her school. Meanwhile, dozens rallied at Tehran's international airport Wednesday evening, where they cheered the return of Elnaz Rakabi, a female rock climber who drew international headlines when she joined a competition in South Korea without wearing a headscarf. On Sunday, the 33-year-old climber wore her hair in a ponytail covered partially by a headband in violation of Iran's strict dress code during a climb at the International Federation of Sport Climbing's Asian Championship and Seoul. There were conflicting reports in the Iranian media about whether Rakabi will now face arrest. She said in an interview with a state-run news agency Wednesday evening that she'd unintentionally forgotten to put on her hijab. The struggle that I had with wearing my shoes and preparing my gear made me forget about the proper hijab that I should have had, and I went to the wall and ascended. This comes as a massive fire engulfed parts of Tehran's infamous Evin prison Saturday, killing at least eight people, injuring dozens more. Witnesses reported hearing explosions and gunfire coming from the prison, known for holding political prisoners. Democracy Now!'s Nermeen Sheikh and I spoke about all of this and more in an in-depth interview with the Iranian activist and lawyer Dr. Shireen Abadi, once held at the Evin prison. Shireen Abadi was the first female judge in Iran. After the 1979 Islamic Revolution, all female judges were dismissed. In 1999, she was imprisoned for nearly a month for her work defending prisoners of conscience. She was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2003, the first Iranian and first Muslim woman to win the award. She used the prize money to set up the Defenders of Human Rights Center. She worked as a human rights lawyer in Iran for decades, focusing in particular on the rights of women, children and political prisoners. She's lived in exile since 2009. Dr. Abadi joined us from London Wednesday. I began by asking her about the protests. The scale of these recent protests are so wide. Even schoolchildren have joined a line of protesters. Even schoolchildren do not want to accept the educational system in Iran. The scale of the protests, the recent ones, of course, are go much, much further and wider than the previous ones. And the main difference between these protests and the previous ones is that uh, in the previous protests, uh, the people used to congregate in various places around cities and towns and chant slogans. But now, um, they've become wiser, the protesters. Uh, they make sure that their protests are all over the country, in various areas, and sporadic. And uh, so it makes it very difficult for anti-riot forces to be present in every corner of the country. And it's very regrettable that in order to crack down on these protesters, the regime is, uh, uh, is even trying to um, persuade children by giving them money to go and join the um, government forces and stand against the protesters. And um, meanwhile, 
Many protesters have been uh, arrested, uh, including schoolchildren, and one, school one of the schoolchildren was killed when the school was raided. And also, the regime is exploiting orphans in the country and uh, is uh, turning them more or less into child soldiers for the regime. Dr. Ibadi, could you uh, elaborate on that? What do you mean that the regime is turning uh, children into ch child soldiers? Look, the, the Iranian government is a signatory to the Convention for the Rights of the Child. And, as you know, the Convention says it is forbidden to use children in wars, in conflicts. But the Iranian government used uh, these children as child soldiers in the Iran-Iraq war, if you remember, and even now it's using um, some children for the uh, same purpose. And the situation of children in Iran is absolutely dire. Children under the age of 18 are um, executed, and it's one of the very few countries in the world where there is still death penalty for uh, young people under the age of 18. And, um, and they also constantly arrest and imprison juveniles. And, um, when you look at the footage from the protest, you actually can actually see these children who are uh, clearly under the age of 18. And it's um, very clear that they either pay these uh, children or um, they try every way possible to persuade these children to join them because they don't have enough in soldiers in their anti-riot force. Dr. Badi, could you also explain how the changing demographics in the country have altered uh, in the years since uh, the revolution? Half of uh, the population of Iran was born now after the 79 revolution, and so have known no other government uh, than the governments that came into power following that. Uh, and also the literacy rates uh, among women, the way that they They've increased exponentially uh, since the revolution. Prior to 79, uh, uh, women's literacy was below 30 percent, and now it's over 80 percent. Uh, more than half uh, of students at universities are now women. How does this figure into uh, uh, the protests happening today and, and the fact that we see, as, as you were talking about earlier, so many young people participating, and that these protests are, are really being led by women? young women? Yes, absolutely. Over 50 percent of students in our universities are female. And um, likewise, many of our professors at university are female. We have highly educated women in the country, and it's natural that educated women are aware. They're aware of their rights, and they cannot tolerate the discrimination they are being subjected to, and, um, and they have been subjected to since the 1979 revolution. And it is for that very reason that in every protest, and uh, I'm not just talking about the recent protests, but in every protest we've had since the revolution, it's the women who've been at the forefront. And uh, to, I would like to elaborate and give you a few examples of some of the laws that were adopted after the 1979 revolution, so you can understand why women are protesting. In addition to um, enforced hijab in Iran, based on law in Iran, the life of a woman is only considered worth half of that a man. For instance, if my brother and I are um, in a car crash and the damaged a court of law, a 
awards to my brother is twice as much as that awarded to me. And also, the testimony of two women in Iran is tantamount to the testimony of one man in a court of law. Or if a married woman wants to travel, she will not be allowed to do so without the written permission of her husband. And we have so many discriminatory laws against uh, women. So it's very natural that uh, such educated women will not put up with such discriminatory laws, all of which, I repeat, were adopted after the 1979 revolution. That is why the disenchantment is uh, chiefly among women. D Dr. Avadi, um, there was a fire that broke out at the notorious uh, Evin prison this weekend. At least eight people died. This is a place where political prisoners have been held for years. I believe you yourself was held there, but you certainly represented prisoners who have been held there. Can you talk about what you understand happened uh, and the significance of this prison? The precise reason for the fire is still not clear. According to the government, the prisoners had started the fire. However, the conditions in the prison are not such to allow prisoners to do such a thing. Um, there is, they have a room where they do needlework, and they claim that the fire started there. Usually at five o'clock, they close the needlework factory, and so they will not, they would not have been, and they said the fire started there. So how could the fire have started there when the door was shut at 5 p.m., as it is every day? Also. The first report that was broadcast on state media after this incident was that the eight people killed um, were trying to escape prison. And as they were trying to escape, they stepped on mines that we have uh, around the prison. So what you heard was not the sound of um, bullets. It was the sound of explosions resulting from the mines they had stepped on. And it's really tragic to hear that, because the government, in a way, is admitting that inside the city inside uh, a prison, and, and uh, they have uh, they have planted mines, and this is a serious offence, and. Uh, the Iranian government uh, should be made uh, answerable. They are not allowed to pl uh, put mines anywhere. So the real reason is still not clear, and nor is the number of those killed so far. However, um, there are a number of prisoners that no one has heard from since. And they, um, no one has been able to contact them or um, have meetings with them. We have heard that the women's ward for political prisoners, they are okay, and they, uh, nothing has happened to them. However, in the men's section, there are some uh, prisoners, political prisoners, we have not heard from, and we are extremely worried about them. We don't know whether they've been killed, whether they're injured, if they're injured, which hospital they're in. Why do we not know or what has happened to them? Uh, Dr. Ibadi, you yourself uh, were uh, uh, imprisoned at Evin, uh, as was your husband. Uh, when exactly was that? And, and could you talk about what the conditions in the prison were, and if and whether, uh, whether and how uh, conditions in the prison changed over the years as you continued uh, to represent people uh, uh, detained there? <laughs> 
It was about 1999 when I was imprisoned in Evan. And um, while I was there, I was uh, put in solitary confinement. And a solitary confinement is a very, very small, narrow uh, room without a bed or chair, and they just gave us a dirty blanket and not a pillow or anything to sleep on. So we had to, I had to sleep on the floor without a pillow, and as a result, uh, I have had um, health problems since. They take everything away from us. They took my watch, even my reading glasses, and uh, we are completely isolated in solitary confinement. We have no um, opportunity to speak to anybody, including our uh, lawyers. And I can say the situation has not changed. It's still the same. And uh, all those who are prisoners of uh, conscience, when arrested, they uh, have to experience solitary confinement for a while, because in solitary confinement, uh, they can put uh, psychological pressure on the prisoner and uh, make them um, confess, make false confessions. And unfortunately, these prisoners are subjected to um, the most gruesome tortures in all Iran's prisons, including Evin. And, um, and I'm sure you're aware that several prisoners died under torture, including a young worker who was a blogger. And his name was Sattar Beheshti. And a few years ago, he died. He was under torture. And unfortunately, every year, we have one or two political prisoners who die under torture. We have figures for all that. Dr. Badi, do you think um, President Trump pulling the U.S. out of the Iran nuclear accord further radicalized the regime there uh, by isolating it further with increased sanctions? Um, and I'm wondering what you think the U.S. policy should be today. Man I'm going to answer your question in this way, that um, before Iran was not under any sanctions for three years after the signing of JCPOA, before Trump pulled out of JCPOA. And in the three years, um, that there were no sanctions on Iran. There were no improvements in Iranian people's welfare situation. So it makes no difference for the Iranian people's welfare and economic situations, whether the United States is a party to JCPOA or not, or whether or not there have been sanctions on Iran. However, if they do lift sanctions against Iran, be sure that Iran does not spend any of its money on the people. What does it spend the money on? It spends it on Lebanon's Hezbollah, Houthis in Yemen, or Bashar al-Assad's uh, regime in Syria. And um, more recently, it's been helping uh, uh, Russia to kill the Ukrainian people, unfortunately. Uh, the Iranian people's welfare and well-being means nothing to the Islamic Republic regime. Uh, Dr. Abadi, uh, on uh, Evin prison, uh, one of the people who has been held there now uh, for years is someone you worked very closely with, uh, the Iranian human rights lawyer Nasreen Sotoudeh. She was also your lawyer for a time. Uh, could you uh, talk about what you know of her situation 
Today, she's been, uh, she was previously awarded both the Right Livelihoods Award as well as the Sakharov Prize. Uh, she was initially imprisoned for 38 years, but uh, her sentence has reportedly been reduced. Nasreen Sotudeh is a human rights lawyer, and she is a colleague of mine. And uh, she ends up in prison, and uh, she's uh, been meted out a long, term, a long prison sentence for defending human rights prisoners. She's been ill in prison, and um, fortunately, thanks to the doctors, uh, they have allowed her to come on leave to receive some treatment. Working for human rights and defending the rights of people in Iranian courts is uh, considered a crime these days. The human rights lawyers who end up in prison are charged uh, with um, allegations such as you must be against the government, otherwise you wouldn't be defending people who are anti-government. And I have said on many occasions, look, if we are defending a thief, does it mean that uh, we are complicit in the uh, act of theft? So why do you uh, arrest a lawyer who is defending human rights activists and accuse him of being uh, complicit with the with such people, with the opposition. That is why many political activists, whether they're lawyers or non-lawyers, they end up in prison. I have to remind you, we have very well-known film uh, directors in prison. We have very well-known authors in prison. And the situation in Iran is that anyone who says a word against the government or uh, makes a documentary or a film about the government or writes anything uh, against the government will, uh, without doubt, end up behind bars. We continue our conversation with the Iranian activist, the lawyer, the 2003 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Dr. Shireen Abadi. She writes in her book, Until We Are Free, quote, I received the Nobel Peace Prize in October 2003 for my efforts for democracy and human rights. And though you would think that this would have propelled my work in Iran and won me some grudging respect, it put me under even more pressure and scrutiny by the government. The Iranian state did everything it could to suppress the news of my award, forbidding the state radio and TV stations to so much as mention it, and putting me under even more severe news embargo. When a reporter asked President Mohammad Khatami, a reformist who was in power at the time, why he had not congratulated me, he responded, this isn't such an important prize. It's only the Nobel in literature that really matters, he said. That's Dr. Shireen Abadi. She worked as a human rights lawyer in Iran for decades, was the first female judge in Iran. She's lived in exile since 2009. Democracy Now!'s Nermeen Sheikh and I spoke with her on Wednesday. Abadi, just to go back uh, to what you were saying about the protests, that these are different from all the protests that erupted in Iran, that have erupted uh, over the course of the last more than 40 years since the revolution. Could you explain, I mean, the one that received an enormous amount of uh, coverage uh, here was the 2009 Green Movement, when also millions of people turned out on the streets. Uh, the protests lasted for seven months. And in and even then, the regime uh, response, the government response, was quite brutal. Uh, how do you see this protest as, as different from, from that one? And, and do you think this will endure, given how, how uh, brutal and violence, uh, violent the, the government response has been? Look, in the previous protest, such as the one in 2009, People had a specific demand. In 2009, they were protesting against the rigged election. They were saying, what happened to my vote? But now, 
The demand is different and the demand is a political one. They want regime change. And they have all taken to the streets and they are all chanting, we want regime change. This is one of the fundamental differences between these protests and the previous ones. And the people are um, be, uh, resisting a lot better than before, of course, uh, the prisons are full, many have been killed, many have been injured. And uh, because the prisons are overcrowded, the regime is even using sports stadium to, as prisons. I somehow doubt very much that the government will again be able to repress the people. I think the people will succeed. As I said, even school children can no longer tolerate this. They, they've refused to go to their classes and they have taken to the streets. And you see generations next to each other. You see children, parents, grandparents protesting uh, together on the streets. And even, let's assume that the government manages to repress the people by intensifying their crackdown, I promise you that in a very, very short time there will be yet another protest in Iran. In fact, Iran, it's, it, it is like a powder keg about to explode. It's, um, they may be able to uh, try and... Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fire. It's a fire that is about to um, um, become bigger and bigger. So there's nothing the government can do. Dr. Abadi, if you can talk about the marginalized regions, for example, the violence of security forces in Iran's Kurdistan, Masa Amini, uh, the young woman who is the flashpoint in these protests, was 22 years old, an Iranian Kurdish woman from Kurdistan, though she was killed in Tehran, and also the systemic killing of Baluchi protesters. What is the status of the Baluchi? minority. The Baluchi are mostly Sunni in a majority Shia state. Unfortunately, the minorities in Iran are subjected to extreme discrimination. When you look at the people on death row in Iran, you will see that 95 percent of those on death row are from minorities in Iran. The government um, represses them more than others. Mahsa Amini, in her um, birth certificate, she wanted to, her parents wanted to call her Gina, which is a Kurdish name. But the government did not allow that, because they said, you're not allowed to choose a Kurdish name. You have to choose a Fars or Persian name for your child. And this is this is real oppression against a minority group. Masa was a young girl. She had come to Tehran um, just as a tourist and also to visit a few of her relatives. And she was on the street with her brother when the morality police, under the pretext that her headscarf wasn't covering the whole head, arrested her and uh, they took her to a detention center and unfortunately a few hours later an ambulance left that detention center which was carrying the corpse of uh, Mahsa and the doctors in the hospital said that when Mahsa arrived in hospital 
She had uh, suffered from concussion, and there was nothing we could do about it. And the pictures that they took from of Mahsa in hospital, when you can see her with uh, uh, drips and serums attached to her, you can see clearly that there is blood coming out of her ears in those uh, pictures, which is a clear sign that she was concussed. And, um, and she was clearly in, uh, you know, she'd fallen into coma and uh, started uh, bleeding. But since this government never tells the truth, they said that uh, she had, she was already sick, she had underlying diseases, and she had died from there, and that made the people even angrier. Now, in Zahedan, a commander of a police force raped a 15-year-old girl, and um, uh, they took the case to court, and the, it didn't get anywhere, so the people became very angry. So the people of Zahedan, especially the young people, they decided to take to the streets after the Friday prayers and uh, chant against that uh, commander who had raped this young girl. And the Friday prayers had just ended in Zahedan that uh, some 20 to 30 Baluchi youth started uh, chanting against the whole regime that is not, uh, um, that is ignoring justice and is not bringing this commander to book. But since the police knew this was going to happen, they were ready for the protesters and they started uh, gunning down the protesters, even those who had just left the mosque and weren't part of the protest. Many of them were also killed. The number of those killed so far, uh, as far as we know, over 95 have been killed. And these are the ones we know because we have their names and we have their identity papers. And many have been injured and are still in hospital. And we are still waiting to see whether they will recover or whether they will die in hospital. Uh, Dr. Abadi, you mentioned uh, earlier that the protesters are uh, calling for a change in the regime. Uh, how do you understand what that means? Uh, your response, for instance, to uh, the present uh, uh, head of state, uh, uh, Ibrahim Raisi, uh, whom Amnesty International has said uh, there is credible evidence of his involvement in crimes against humanity. If you could talk about his record uh, and whether you think uh, uh, the repression that his administration has carried out uh, has something to do with the force of these uh, protests. Of course, there is no doubt that uh, Raisi in the 80s played a big part in the killing of political prisoners. There is no doubt about that. However, to say that the um, pro protests this time are even more powerful than before, it's not just because of Raisi. It is because of the anger that is boiling over, and for 43 years, people have bottled up all this anger. And for 43 years, the regime has turned a deaf ear to the demands of the people. And anyone who has said anything against the regime has either ended up in prison or killed or has been um, has fled the country. There, there's been a huge brain drain. And we have lost many educated people they didn't want to leave Iran, but they had to. So it's um, 
When you, it's a collection of all these issues that has led to these uh, recent protests and where people are calling for regime change. And, and allow me to add that what the people want is a democratic and a secular government. That's what they want. Because for 43 years, they have suffered a theocracy, and they know what a theocracy is like. They no longer want to tolerate a theocracy. They want a democracy, and they want secularism. And so could you talk about the fate uh, of uh, precisely the supreme leader, uh, Khamenei, who is reportedly very ill, but is grooming his son uh, to be uh, his successor? Could you explain the significance of that, the role that the supreme leader plays, and what impact these protests might have? Uh, Khamenei, Khamenei has been reported ill for a very, very long time, yet we still see him giving speeches. And as always, he's ascribing all these protests to the enemies. If Khamenei dies, I cannot imagine that we will have another Supreme Juris Consult or Valiye Fakhri, because the situation in Iran is far worse than ever, and they will not allow any other cleric to take over and continue this despotic theocracy. One of the chants uh, that you hear is are, uh, that some of the slogans chanted uh, these days are against Mujtaba Khamenei, who is the son of Khamenei. So the people are chanting anti Mujtaba Khamenei slogans to ensure that he doesn't uh, take over. I, but I really don't think that if Khamenei dies, there will be any successor. Could you How do you exactly see, Dr. Abadi, this uprising playing out? It's still too early to predict what these protests are going to lead to. But one thing I can tell you for sure, nothing will ever be the same in Iran after these protests because the situation has already changed a lot since before the protest. But as to how the future will be, it is still premature to uh, make any uh, predictions. And finally, Dr. Shirin Abadi, what do you hope will come out of these protests? My hope is the victory of the people. And my hope is that we have a, the stage a referendum under the auspices of the United Nations so that the people freely choose the government they, they want and their representatives. This is my wish for the people of Iran. Iranian activist and lawyer Dr. Shireen Abadi. She was the first female judge in Iran, received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2003, the first Iranian and first Muslim woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. She was speaking to us from London. And this breaking news, the British Prime Minister Liz Truss is resigning. She's the shortest-serving prime minister in U.K. history. The move comes less than a week after Truss fired her chancellor, Kwasi Kwartung. She sought to blame him for the recent Tory budget, which slashed taxes and caused the pound to plummet. This comes as the U.K. is facing record inflation and a surging cost of living, which have spurred mass protest. The Daily Star had a live stream called, Can Liz Truss Outlast a Lettuce? After just 45 days, the lettuce has won.
And that does it for our show. Democracy Now! is currently accepting applications for a video news production fellow and a people and culture manager. Learn more and apply at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Messiah Rhodes, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Tarasena, Tammy Warren, Trina Nadura, Sam Alkoff, Tamari Astudio, John Hamilton, Rabbi Karen, Hani Masood, and Mary Conlon. Our executive director is Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, John Randolph, Paul Powell, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, Hugh Grant, Dennis Moynihan, David Prude, and Dennis McCormick. Tune in tomorrow on Democracy Now! We'll be going to Britain for the latest, and we'll also be talking about other red shoes. I'm Amy Goodman.